Let me ask you to turn tonight uh, to the Gospel of John, chapter number 3. I'm going to preach tonight from John chapter number 3, and I know you've probably heard uh, preaching from John chapter 3 all of your life. If you've been in Baptist churches very long, you've heard preachers preach about the new birth, and you've heard them preach from John chapter number 3. But we're going to do that tonight with the help of the Lord. Uh, John chapter 3, we'll begin reading in verse number 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, You must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel? That's actually in the original language. Are you the master of Israel and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak, un, we speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and you receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved." He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Now, as you well know, the Gospel of John is a revelation of who Jesus Christ is. At the end of the book, John gives the the reason for writing the book. He said that he wrote these things in order that people might believe that Jesus was the Messiah, the Christ, and that through believing on him, they might have life, that is, eternal life. Now, chapter number two tells us that Jesus had performed a great miracle. When you read that chapter, you'll uh, find that he performed his first miracle in Cana of Galilee. Um, He turned the water into wine. Verse 11 of that chapter says, This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. You go through the chapter, you have the cleansing of the temple there and the rest of chapter number 2, and you come down to the end of that chapter, and uh, you have something that's really strange. Listen to this. It says, now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, verse 23, in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men 
and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Now catch it, chapter 3, verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. One of the strange things about that passage that, that I just read to you in chapter 2 is the phrase, many believed in his name. And then the next verse says, but Jesus did not commit himself unto them. Actually, the word believed on his name and commit himself unto them is the same word. In other words, they believed in Jesus, but Jesus didn't believe in them. Jesus knew what was in man. These people were following him because they saw him turn water into wine. They were, saw, they were following him because they saw miracles. They were following him for what they could get out of him and what they could see. It was kind of a, almost a sideshow. I told you the other night that when the Lord Jesus drew a crowd, almost immediately he said, let's go somewhere else. You know, today when we draw a crowd, we think, boy, let's do something to get a bigger crowd. But the Lord Jesus would say, there's other cities and there's other places where I need to go. The crowd's getting too big here. Let's go somewhere else. And uh, he would do that. He wasn't interested in putting on a show. He wasn't interested for people uh, uh, that people would look at him and just be um, amazed at the things that he was doing, the things in nature and the things with healings and even raising the dead. That is not why he did those things. You know why the Lord Jesus healed people? Do you know why he raised the dead? Do you know why he calmed storms? He did that to help people because he loved people. He had compassion on them, the Bible says. He, and, and the scripture says he went about Galilee and, and Judea doing good things. He loved people. He did random acts of kindness, if you will. He, he loved people to help people. He would look at people and he would see them as, as, um, as, as baby chicks. He would see them as lambs that had no shepherd to take care of them. His heart of compassion reached out to them. And so he didn't do these things in order to draw a crowd or in order to have a show. He did these things because he's the son of God. He is full of love and mercy and grace. And he had grace and mercy on people who crowded around him and people who were in need. Now, Nicodemus comes to him by night, the Bible says. Nicodemus, a Pharisee, the master in Israel. He's supposed to be an absolute master when it comes to interpreting Scripture and teaching the Israelites, the people of Judea. He, he's a leader in Israel. And he comes to Jesus by night. He comes with flattering words. He says, Lord, we know that you come from God because here he is, just like the rest of the natural men over here. We see the miracles which you do. And so he's, he's complimenting the Lord. But you know, the Lord doesn't respond to that. I think if somebody comes up to me a lot of times and says, Brother Mike, I like you because such and such, I, I'm, I'm, prone, I'm kind of prone to say, well, thank you. I, pr I appreciate you. Liking me for that reason, you know, or I, I appreciate people liking me for any reason, you know. Um, but the Lord wasn't like that. When Nicodemus came to him with flattering words, it was as if the Lord Jesus cut immediately to the chase. He knew what was in Nicodemus, and he knew what was not in Nicodemus. He knew exactly where Nicodemus was before God. And so the first thing out of the Lord Jesus' mouth is, truly, truly, of a truth, I say unto you, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And so he introduces this whole idea of something happening to a man in order for him to see, and later he says he cannot, unless he's born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And so the Lord Jesus immediately goes to Nicodemus' need. Now let me say this to you tonight. As far as I know, this is the last night of the meeting. I prayed today and I sought the face of the Lord. And uh, I, I thought to myself, I thought, well, you know, there'll probably just be church members there tonight, just just the faithful flock that usually come on Wednesday night, maybe. And, and uh, yet the Lord kept burdening my heart to preach on this issue of the new birth. Having been born again, having had a radical change on the inside of your heart, 
that has made a new creature out of you and changed you completely. Over the years, I have seen too many um, Sunday school teachers saved. Over the years, I've seen a few preachers saved. Over the years, I've seen a few um, uh, song leaders saved. I've seen people saved off the piano bench, you know, people I'm telling you tonight, folks, that just because you're a religious person and go to church and have your name down there on the church roll and maybe even teach a Sunday school class or maybe a deacon or maybe a preacher or just because those things are in your life doesn't necessarily mean that you've been born again by the Spirit of God. And that's what was going on with with Nicodemus here. He was a Bible teacher. He was a political leader. He was a respected man in the community. He knew that Old Testament. At least he thought he did. And uh, he comes to Jesus. And probably when he gives the Lord this compliment, we know you're from God because we see the miracles that you do. Most likely he was secretly hoping that the Lord would say, yes, Nicodemus, uh, yeah, I've heard your reputation too. We, we know you're a man of God too. Probably Maybe with that thought in his mind. But the Lord Jesus never plays around with us. The Lord Jesus never flatters us. He says, boy, I tell you, the one who said that our words would judge us one day never wasted words himself. And so he says to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, your real problem is you need to be born again. You can't see the kingdom of God. You can't enter the kingdom of God until you've been born again. You just, you just, it's, a, it's an absolute impossibility. There is no way you're going to understand spiritual things. You can't see the kingdom of God. There is no way you're going to enter in and participate and fellowship in the things of God. Now, the great travesty is that we can, we can participate in most of the things in our modern Baptist churches today. You can participate in Sunday school. You can participate in a good theological d- discussion. You, you can participate in, in um, all kinds of religious activity and still never have been born again. But Jesus said if you're going to enter into the fellowship of the kingdom of God, if there's really a connection, a spiritual connection between you and other saved people, and if there's really a spiritual connection between you and heaven, there has to be something radically changed on the inside of you. Jesus said to him, you must, you must, you must be born again. They asked John Wesley on one occasion why He was constantly preaching on, you must be born again. And his answer was, because you must be born again. It's an absolute truth. Nothing else helps you. Nothing else brings you into vital living fellowship with God. Men have to be born again or they don't know God. They have to be born again or there's no way in the world they can fellowship with heaven. There's there's, there's no spiritual reality in their life. And uh, I really want you to, uh, in your mind, I want you to make that difference tonight between obvious outward church reality and genuine inward spiritual reality. Because there is a definite difference between those things. Now, Nicodemus saith unto him, verse number four, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Now, Stop and think just a minute. How, how, how dark could a man's heart be if when the Lord says to him, you have to be born again, he immediately thinks in physical terms. Now, here's the master in Israel. He, he probably knows by heart much of the Old Testament. He probably knows the passages in the Old Testament in Ezekiel and other places where God said he would give them a new heart. He probably had those passages of Scripture memorized in his mind. But when Jesus used this term, you have to be born from above, you have to be born again, he absolutely went to the physical instead of the spiritual and began to think, I'm an old man, How, what do you mean? He probably got the idea, you need to start all over again. You need need to start life all over again. How can I do that since I'm old, Nicodemus said. How can I enter my mother's womb and be born? 
had a strange notion about what the new birth is. But you know, I find people today have strange notions about what the new birth is. People think the new birth is uh, just knowing about Jesus. Um, I was raised in church, brother mine. I've heard people testify like this. I was raised in church. Well, I've known about Jesus all of my life. Of course I'm a Christian. Well, I've, I've, when I was a little baby, they brought me to church. And I, I, I went, I'm going to date myself now. I went to Sunbeams. You remember Sunbeams? I, I, I grew up in the church. I went to BYPU. How about that one? I grew up in the church. I've always known about Jesus. Now, let me stop you just there for a moment. You can have a clear understanding and a historical faith in Jesus and still never have been born again by the Spirit of God. A historical faith believes the facts of the gospel. If you read the Bible and it says Jesus was born of a virgin, okay, I believe that. Jesus lived a perfect life, okay, I believe that. Jesus died on the cross for our sins, okay, I believe that. I might not know what that means, but I believe that. The Bible says that and I believe it. God raised him from the dead on the third day, I believe that. He's ascended into heaven to make intercession for us, whatever that means. I I believe that. I believe the gospel, so I have to be saved, right? No. No. How many of you believe in Abraham Lincoln? I mean, um, I, I believe there was a person named George Washington. I doubt very seriously if he threw a silver dollar across the Potomac River or the Delaware, the Delaware River. Because where he's supposed to do it was a mile wide. But anyway, that's beside the point. I I believe, I believe, I believe he was at Valley Forge. I believe he, I believe he led the American Revolution against England. I, I believe those things. But you know, I've never had George to come put his arm around me. I've never felt George moving in my heart. I've never wept before George. I've had a historical knowledge because my teachers told me that George Washington existed and these certain things happened. And Abraham Lincoln existed and these certain things happened. That is a historical faith. That is a historical knowledge of certain facts. And I'll tell you, our churches have many, many people in them who profess to know Jesus Christ and their knowledge of Christ and their knowledge of the new birth does not rise above just a history lesson, just a historical knowledge. And that's why when they go through the doors out there, it really doesn't affect their lives. They they come to church. They know how to be churchy, but it doesn't affect their lives. They have a historical knowledge, and if you ask them if they're saved, they would say, sure, how do you know you're saved? Well, the the way I know I'm saved is I believe Jesus came, I believe he lived, I believe he died, I believe he rose, I believe he's coming again. I believe all of those things, so I must be saved. Not so. Not so. That's just a notion that people have about the new birth. Here's one. Well, Brother Mike, once I asked Jesus into my heart. Brothers, I I tell you, I I have, uh, and sisters, I have great problem with that. Now, the Bible says, to as many as received him, to them gave he the authority to become the sons of God. But those people were born of God. Not of the will of the flesh, the will of man, but born of God. That's John chapter 1. I have a great problem with this business of, well, I've asked Jesus to come into my heart. What does that mean exactly? Do you have a, do you have a little room down there somewhere that you've asked Jesus to come and occupy? I heard a preacher give an invitation one night, and it was, it was like uh, go down in an elevator or something and, and just open the door to Jesus. Let Jesus step in there, something crazy like that. 
have a friend in Texas who was teaching in a in a Christian school and in that Christian school they brought the little children in and they had a puppet and they called him Sammy Lammy and they talked about that puppet was like Jesus and would you do you believe in Sammy Lammy and they had children being baptized on their profession of faith in Sammy Lammy One of the most dangerous things we do as Southern Baptist is we have our vacation Bible schools in the summer. We have one too. And we go through all of our programs, which is fine. Teach those kids the Word of God. That's what you should do. And at the end of those programs, in many, many Southern Baptists, I, I don't have any statistics, But in many Southern Baptist churches, independent Baptist churches, in many Baptist churches, at the end of that week, all the children are gathered together. The preacher gives an outline of the gospel and tells them what the gospel is, has them bow their heads and says something to them like, do you want to go to heaven when you die? Now, I want to ask you, what five-year-old, six-year-old, four-year-old for that matter, ten-year-old doesn't want to go to heaven when they die? How many of them don't want to go to heaven when they die? How many do you think would raise their hand and say, I'd rather go to hell when I die? Not any of them. And then we get them to, to come. And we say, now pray this prayer after me. Ask Jesus into your heart. Lord, come into my heart and say, And then we run them like cattle through a cattle dip. And we tell them, this is the day the Lord saved you. You put that in your Bible. And don't you ever doubt it. And if the devil or some preacher that's preaching the truth, if the devil ever comes along and tries to make you doubt your salvation, you go back and read that. You you read that date right there. And you remember when you asked Jesus to come into your heart. I wish you'd show me in this Bible where it says, ask Jesus to come into your heart. There are people being deceived all over our nation, and it's not just Baptist. All over our nation by people being told that if you'll say this prayer after me. I want you to see the deception in that. Let's get off the children for a second. Think about adults who are told. I've been to conferences and... and, uh, and evangelistic campaigns, and at the end, the evangelist. I heard an evangelist one night say that he, came, he just about went to hell over a, 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 a three-year-old prayer. He was three years old. Somebody got him to pray a prayer, and he prayed it as a three-year-old, and for years he put his faith in that profession of faith. And he said years later, God showed him that he was lost, and he came to the Lord. And at the end of that service, having given that testimony, he had people to come down to the front. He then led them in a prayer, and told them if they would pray this prayer after me, and if you're sincere, then God will save you. And he led them in a prayer. Now, I want, you, I want you to see something that's subtle here. My faith has found a resting place, not in a creed, not in a prayer I've prayed, But faith rests in the person of Jesus Christ. You would be surprised at the people that I'm sure these other preachers have counseled with. And I have over the years of people who say things like, well, I want to say this right. Or tell me the words to say so I can say these words right. Do you understand? You're putting your faith You're you're resting your faith in the words that you're saying rather than on the finished work of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as he dies on Calvary's cross? Do you understand that? You see, the danger in telling people, pray this prayer after me, and putting words in their mouth. I found that effective one time in my life. One time in my life. I'll tell you that story. For years, for years, I had preached just like I'm preaching right now. I do not believe any less what I'm preaching tonight than I believed then. I believe there's a lot of people being deceived by someone telling them, 
pray this prayer after me. One of our church members, her dad was lost. This was a man who had never been to church. This was a wicked man, and he had never been to church. And he came up with cancer. And Tina would come before the church on prayer meeting nights, and she would beg us to pray for her dad. She got into this crazy thing. She said, well, I don't know whether he's one of the elect or not. I don't know. I don't know whether God wants to save him or not. And she said, one night she was reading where the Bible says God wants to save all men. And she said, that means my dad too. And she confessed that before the church. We continued to pray for her dad. I was coming back from Paducah. I'd already been to visit him three or four times. I'd given him the gospel every time I went as as well as I could. And I was coming back that day, and the Lord just nudged my heart and said, go see him again. And so I went over to his house again. And I sat there with him that afternoon, and I just, I just gave him the gospel again. And he looked at me now, very ignorant man, no churchiness about him. And he looked at me, and he said, what do I do? And I said, well, you pray. You cry out to God. Tell him how you feel. Tell him what you want. And I bowed my head. Yeah, it was that quiet. I raised my head and look at, looked at him, and he was looking straight at me. I said, well, did anything happen? He said, what do I do? And I said, you pray, you cry out to God. That's what you do. And he said, what do I say? And I said, this is what you say. And I told him what to pray. And he prayed. And God saved him. God saved him. I believe God saved that man that night. But that's the only time in my 45 years of ministry that I can look at that situation and say, I believe God saved that person. I I have to say to my shame, in my early days, I've been trained this way. I've led people in the prayer. I've told them, now, now, if you've trusted the Lord and you were sincere. You know, the Bible doesn't say sincerity saves you. It's the blood of Christ. It's the work of Jesus Christ on the cross that saves. It's not sincerity. And when we're talking about this new birth business, we're not talking about, we're not talking about, uh, just saying a prayer or asking Jesus into our hearts. That's a, that's a notion. That, do you understand that for hundreds of years, hundreds of years, they never gave an invitation in church? No, I'm not against invitations. I, 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 I give them occasionally. I don't give them every Sunday. But that's fine. But do you understand that people have gotten saved and they walked with God and hundreds of thousands of people have gotten saved over the years who would not even know what an invitation is? How did they get saved, Brother Mike? They were born again by the Spirit of God. They heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. God began to work in their heart. God worked faith in them, repentance in them, and faith in them. And they turned away from themselves, and they turned to Christ. Many of them were saved at home. Many of them were saved while... John Wesley was saved while he was sitting in a congregation listening to somebody read a commentary. One of the greatest evangelists who ever lived. We get these notions about what it means to be born again. It's not asking Jesus into your heart. It's not praying a prayer. Now, I hope I brought you along tonight to where you're the point to say to me, Brother Mike, then what is, what is the new birth? What does it really mean to be born again? Well, notice what the Lord Jesus said to Nicodemus. He said in verse number 3, except a man be born again, and they tell us that word means from above, 
He cannot see the kingdom of God. Verse 5, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, you must be born again. So the first thing I would say is that it is a spiritual birth. It's not physical. It's, it's spirit wrought, born from above, born from the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit of God brings this to your heart. Now, he doesn't do it without means, but you listen to me closely. It is a spiritual thing. I'm going to say something that's going to sound radical to you. But I believe the Word of God bears it out. You can't get saved just any time you want to. Just because you want to. What I mean by that is, I want you to turn back to that passage in in John chapter number 1 and verse number 12. Listen to what it says. It says, but as many as received him... To them gave he the authority, the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born, past tense now. Actually, I think it's a perfect tense. Which were born, not of blood, not not because of who your mom and dad was, nor of the will of the flesh, not because you just one day decide to choose it, and not of the will of man, not, not out of human ability at all, but they were born of, out of, as a source from God. Listen to me. Regeneration or the new birth is a gift to you personally from God. And it is a spiritual thing. God doesn't owe it to you. God doesn't have to save anybody. If God put all of us in hell, he would be a a righteous and a holy and a good God. If he put half of us in hell, he would be a holy and good and righteous God. If he put all of us but one in hell and saved one of us, he would be a good, righteous, and holy God. God is not obligated to save any of us. I don't know how many of you have been watching the Jody Arias thing on television. Anybody know what I'm talking about? She slit her boyfriend's throat and shot him 17 times and, and uh, bludgeoned him with something. And so they convicted her. She's guilty. She even admitted that she was guilty. Now, they're deliberating right now as to whether to give her the death penalty or not. Let me tell you something. If they give her the death penalty, they haven't been unfair to her. Justice has been served. God said in the Old Testament, if a man takes another man's life, his life is forfeited. So justice has been served if they take her life. She's the offender here. Do you understand that? You and I are the offenders here. We're the ones who sinned against God. And if mercy is given to us, it's because God is merciful. If if that jury, if they say, no, we're going to give her life in prison, we're going to give her her life, but we're going to give her life in prison, that is absolute mercy on their part. That is not what they are obligated to do. And God is not obligated to save us. God is not obligated to birth us into his kingdom. God is a righteous and a holy, just God. Now listen to me closely. If he saves you, hear me, it's by grace. It is not by obligation. It is not because God has to save you. It's because he is a God full of grace and mercy That's what Paul says in Ephesians chapter number 2. But God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us hath quickened us. He brought us to life. I tell you, God has to do that. That's what the new birth is. It's, It's the explosion. It's the radical change on the inside of you that God performs. Now, Now, listen to me closely. When Jesus tells Nicodemus these things, 
He tells them, he tells him in the context of the rest of this passage of Scripture. Listen to what he says. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak, verse 11, we speak that we do know. I'm in chapter 3 now, verse 11. And testify that we have seen, and you receive not our witness. If I've told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No man has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Now listen. And as Moses lifted up the the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever, whoever, whosoever believes in him, all the ones who believe in him, should not perish but have eternal life. Now, when Jesus brings up the serpent in the wilderness and then talks about people believing on him, what he is doing is saying to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, the new birth involves not, it's it's not just, just a mystical thing that happens to you, but it comes through the gospel of Jesus Christ. It comes through the message that's preached. That's what Peter says. 1 Peter chapter 1. And verse number 23, Peter says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God that liveth and abideth forever. And this is the word by the gospel which we preached unto you. You see, you're born again by the the reception of, in the depths of your heart, and God enabled you to do this, of the, of the gospel. And here's the word gospel means good news. And you, most of you don't need good news. You've never been in trouble with God. You, you've got it all settled. You've got it all satisfied. You don't have any problems with God whatsoever. You've prayed the prayer. You've said the words. You've done what the evangelist said. You've signed the back of your Bible. You've done all of these things. You've done, 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 done. And you've never come to the end of yourself, seen yourself lost before God in need of some good news. I tell you something. If you were in the bottom of a pit and you were sinking down that deep in mud, and you knew that if somebody didn't help you, you were going to absolutely drown in that mud, if you started hearing on the other side, somebody saying, is there anybody down there? I got a rope for you. If there's anybody down there, you know what you'd start doing? You'd start saying, hey, I'm down here. Help me. Oh, I'm down here. Please help me. Help me. When's the last time you ever got in a shape like that before God? David said, I was in a horrible pit. The Lord lifted me up. The Lord brought me out and set me on solid ground, put a song in my heart and in my mouth. When's the last time? I tell you, I believe if you've genuinely been born again by the Spirit of God, you've had an experience of conviction, lostness. Have you ever experienced being lost? I tell you, you ever get in some of those places, just physically speaking? Poor old Joseph was down in the prison. He thought maybe the butler would help him get, it out, get him out. And for two years, he's absolutely forgotten. It was good news when he heard that Pharaoh was calling him to come to him. I tell you what, it's the gospel. It's good news when you hear, if you're a sinner, if you hear Jesus died for your sins. If you ever see yourself lost and on your way to hell, if you ever understand that you're on your way to a devil's hell, outer darkness where there's gnashing of teeth, where you'll never have joy again, you'll never have peace again. If you, if you really see yourself lost before a holy and a righteous God, And then there's that one little inkling of hope that comes to you. Jesus died for sinners like you. Jesus Christ gave his life on the cross and became a sacrifice for sin so that God would be satisfied toward your sin for sinners just like you. Boy, I tell you, there's a grasping after that. Oh, God, give me that. Give me that. 
And what's the promise of God? As Moses was lifted up, or Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Uh, what happened? Numbers 21. The people had rebelled against God. You know what they had said? They said, we're sick of this manna. We're sick of this light bread. <laughs> we're sick of this manna. That's what my mamma and papa used to call loaf bread, light bread. They said, we're sick of it. We're tired of it. We won't, we, 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 you just brought us out here to kill us, and God just brought us out here to kill us. And God said, well, if you think that, I can accommodate you if you want me to. And so he sent serpents among them, and the serpents bit the people, and they were dying. They were dying right and left. And they began to cry out. When they saw themselves dying from the serpents, what did they do? When they saw themselves lost, what did they do? They said, oh, God, have mercy on us. We repent of our sins. Oh, God, have mercy on us. And God did have mercy on them. And God said, Moses, get a brass serpent, form it around, around us, a stake, and lift it up. And tell the people that the thing that's biting them, if they'll look to this, this serpent, the very thing that's biting them, that's being held up here, I'll heal them. And the Bible says every one of those people that had been snake bitten that looked at that serpent because they believed what God said and they looked at that serpent, every one of them was healed. Now what's bitten you and what's bitten me but sin? And sin is an abomination to God. And sin is killing us. And sin is destroying us. And Jesus said, just like the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness. Now listen closely. For God hath made him to be sin for us. He who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Are you listening to me? God made Jesus the very thing that's killing us. He made him to be sin. He made him to be as if he were as guilty as if he was guilty of our sins. And the only place to be saved is looking to Jesus Christ. And listen to what the promise is. Listen to it now. And whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have life on into the ages. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world, just like he so loved those Israelites in the wilderness. But even more, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that every person who believes in him won't die and go to hell, but they'll have life unto the ages. You want to talk about the new birth? The, the, there is no separating this miraculous, radical work of God in our heart from a soul seeing himself lost and grasping Christ. There's no separating that. Has that ever happened to you? Now remember, I'm not asking you how long you've been a member of the church. I'm not asking how well you've served the Lord, in quotes. I'm asking you if you've ever been born again by the Spirit of the living God. Listen to what he says. He says, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. He that believeth not is condemned already because he hasn't believed on the only begotten Son of God. It's amazing to me how in the Bible, the Lord Jesus always brings things down to two. Two. Listen to me tonight. You're condemned or you're not condemned. There's no middle ground. There's, there's no, I'm almost getting there. You're either under God's wrath and the wrath of God abides on you tonight, or you are uncondemned, free from the wrath of God, absolutely holy, righteous in the sight of God by the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. It's one of those two things. It's not three or four different things. 
It's one of those two things. The Lord brings us out so vividly in Matthew chapter number 7. He says in verse 13, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be that go in thereat. Do you get it? Two gates. One's really wide. You know, just, just, y'all just come on down here and pray this prayer. It's really wide. No change. The other one's, boy, just, just really narrow. I tell you what, there's not any room for anybody but just you and Jesus right there. You go through that straight gate. Not any room for your good works. Not any room for your church membership. Not any, not any room for your sins. Not any room for anything. One of two ways. You walking down the broad way or you walking down the narrow way. Two kinds of teachers to follow. Listen to what he says. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. Now remember, he's talking about false prophets here. He says, a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Now let me ask you a question tonight. What kind of prophets or preachers do you like to follow? I'm really... um, I'm really tempted tonight to name some names. And the only reason I don't is because it distracts some of you and you'd get off in your mind after something else. But I'm telling you, there are some preachers in this country that will take you down the broad way. They will tell you that all Christianity is about is to make you feel good and to have self-esteem. Let me tell you something. Holy Ghost conviction will take the steam out of self-esteem. You don't have any when God gets through with you. All you have is a need for Jesus as a lost sinner. What kind of preachers do you like to follow? Just two kinds. Not everyone saith unto me that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Two professions. One's real and one's not. I'm I'm going to tell you, if you think you're going to go to heaven and give your resume to God as to why he ought to let you into heaven, you're wrong. God's not impressed by your resume. See, your resume is not as good as these guys' resumes. Maybe you've been a church member for all your life, but that doesn't measure up to casting out demons, does it? Does Does that measure up to doing wonder works? Do you understand Jesus just said that people who are going around casting out demons can end up in hell? You say, Brother Mike, I don't believe that. Judas cast out demons and he's in hell tonight. You need to think about that, folks. Two professions. One's real, one's not. Two foundations. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon the house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. That's not what they'd been taught. It's not what they'd heard before. For he taught them as one that had authority and not like the scribes. Now, you know what that little story is about? It's not even about the man or his house. It's about the foundation. And there's just two foundations. One of them is the rock 
Christ, and the other one is sinking sand. Do you understand tonight? You are either on the rock of Jesus Christ, saved by grace, having been born again by the Spirit of God, or you are in sinking sand. And you might enjoy the sand, but it's going to take you to hell anyway. It might be religious sinking sand, but it'll take you to hell anyway. Jesus said to Nicodemus, Are you, not, are you a master in Israel? You don't understand these things. Listen to me tonight. You're condemned or you're not condemned. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Hear hear this now. And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world You know why you're not saved tonight if you're not saved? Men love darkness more than they love the light. And the reason that they love darkness, because everyone that doeth evil hates the light, neither comes to the light lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light that his deeds might be made manifest that they are wrought in God. Now listen, listen. One of Satan's major weapons that he has in keeping church members lost is they want to stay in darkness. What I mean by that is they don't want to face themselves They don't want to say to God, I'm lost. And they certainly don't want to stand before a church and say, pray for me, I'm lost. I need God. But I'm going to tell you, the Holy Spirit of God's working with your heart tonight and dealing with you. That is a mercy. That is a grace. I was saved as a church member after I'd been a church member for 10 years. My wife was saved as a church member. I can't tell you people that I know, church members saved. Paul Washer says that the greatest evangelistic field in America is in the churches. It's not out there on the streets. People out on the streets don't have enough knowledge hardly to understand what you're talking about. We, we live in a pagan nation. The reason is because there's so many lost people in the church. John Piper was quoting Barna, Barna Research. Barna Research does the, the kind of research that says, okay, we've got these kinds of statistics and this kind of statistics. And Barna said that, now listen, he defined the new birth or regeneration, born again, as anybody who had asked Christ into their heart and felt like that commitment was still real to them. That's how he defined the new birth. And then he went on to say that divorce rate among born-again people was the same as the world, and that born-again people got drunk, and that born-again people didn't read their Bibles, and that born-again people blah, 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 just like the rest of the world. And John Piper said, you know, that goes exactly, directly against the New Testament. If Barna had said church people, he would have been right. But he defiled that word born again because the Bible teaches that when people are born again, there is a radical difference in their life. When the Lord saved me, the things I hated before, sitting in church, listening to the boring preaching, uh, I began to love. Man, what's he going to teach me this week? And the things I used to love, that sloppy, old, filthy world out there, I begin to hate. I don't, oh, God, deliver me from that. I don't want to go do that anymore. Lord, keep me from that. There is a radical change when God brings you into his kingdom. When you really see Christ and you turn from yourself and turn to Christ, there is a radical change in your life. You read 1 John, you find that John says those that are born again overcome the world. Those that are born again love their 
brothers in Christ. Those that are born again don't walk in hatred. Those that are born again don't practice sin on and on. He talks about what it really means to be born again. Now my question to you tonight, have you really been born again? Not asking you if you're a good church member. Not asking you if you tithe. Not asking you if you witness to people. Eli Shetler, one of our deacons, he and his wife Pam, and I don't mind telling you this because he tells it publicly, he and his wife, his now wife Pam, he came out of the Amish. Eli came out of the Amish. And he started shacking up with this girl. They shacked up for several years. Eli went down to a little General Baptist church and got to hearing some stuff got to realizing that he'd been told a lie all of his life. You know what the Amish tell him, don't you? If you ever leave the Amish, you can't get right with God until you come back to the Amish. And he said, boy, God just began to show him some things. And he came under conviction, but he didn't know what it was. Didn't have enough light to know what was happening to him. But he went to Pam, his girlfriend, and he said, we're going to change this. We don't live like this. I can't live this way anymore. We're going to get married or we're parting our ways or something. And so they got married. And uh, Eli straightened up. Got to hearing enough gospel so he'd tell other people, especially the Amish folks. He'd tell them, boy, it's not a works, it's, it's by grace. And he'd give you just as clear a gospel message as anybody I know anywhere. I was preaching in the church. We had a lady saved in, in the church church member Lord saved her that's Tammy Lewis she, she, that's another story her confession was I'm trusting Jesus for everything except for my sins when she trusted him to save her from her sins God saved her that night but she'd get up and testify and Eli said I'd sit back in the back and say why don't she shut up I wish she'd shut up I preached on if if, if a person's genuinely saved, his spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. You don't have to have anybody tell you you're saved. God tells you. God bears witness with your spirit. Brother Eli would say, I don't believe that's right. I don't believe he's interpreting that right. He got in the book of Romans in his private devotions, just reading Romans, reading Romans, reading Romans. And he came to chapter number 3 where the Bible talks about Christ becoming the substitute, the propitiation for our sins. And he said he was going down the road one day and he said, Lord, I don't understand. I don't understand that. Oh, God, help me. And he said the Lord came to him and he said, I see, I see it. I see it. For the, I mean, after having witnessed the people, been a good guy, changed his life, I see it. I see what Christ did for me, for me. God saved him on the road on the, way to, on the way to work one morning. Listen to me. Holy Spirit of God is the one that brings you to Christ. Has he ever dealt with you? Has he ever really called you to salvation? Probably some of you right now saying, Brother Mike, I wish you'd shut up. I tell you. If you're in that condition, you better, you better pray. I just keep preaching till you come to Christ. It's Christ. It's nothing else but Jesus Christ. It's turning from yourself and turning to Jesus. And I'll tell you what happens in your life. That old dread comes over your heart. And I don't have to point you out because I don't know who you are. But boy, when God puts his finger right there, he says, it's you, buddy. I'm dealing with you. It don't matter. It doesn't matter what the rest of us think. You better deal with what God knows. If I was in that pit tonight, I believe I'd start crying out for some help. Asking the Lord to help me. Father, I, I ask you tonight, I, I do ask you to help us. Lord, you know, you know our hearts, you know our minds, you know what's going on in every person here tonight. Oh God, and I pray for your mercy. Even now, Lord, we confess we can do nothing. All of our words will accomplish nothing. We pray for the work of your Spirit in hearts. That secret work, oh God, that only you can perform. That powerful work, oh God, that only you can do. 
We commit these people to you. And we thank you, Lord, for all you've done for us. We give you praise tonight in Jesus' name. Amen.